All righty. So let's um, thank, first of all, again, thank you for coming. So why are we even here? I mean, 3D printing is a $3 billion industry, and it's growing every year. It grew 32% last year, so they envision it's going to get monsterly big. The other thing is it's environmentally friendly. That's a big issue for many people nowadays. You know, the reason that it's so hot and heavy is because um, you've got, promotes innovation. That's another thing that's real exciting about it brings value. So what we wanted to talk to you about today was these three concepts. We're going to have somebody talk to you about should you get it? Is it even worth your time to do it? And once you get it, I mean once you decide, hey, I want to do it, how can you get it? We'll talk about some of the corporate mechanisms you can have of getting money, getting financing, getting ways to build it, uh, build a business to start doing 3D printing. And then the other issue is once you have it, then what? There's a variety of legal issues associated with it too. How do you protect it? How are you going to deal with labor issues? How are you going to deal with lit, um, uh, insurance issues? That kind of stuff. People that are going to talk to you today are Kelly Goodsell, president of Time Compression Inc. He'll be the first one that talks about it. He's, that's a company that does additive manufacturing. Then uh, my, me, Alan Rothenbucher, Joe Keglovich, Michael Lieber, and Megan Sapino. We have at Ice Miller, we created an, annu, um, an additive manufacturing vertical. So what we do is we've done an initiative that we cover all the bases, not just intellectual property, but we also cover from the f corporate side to the insurance side to the taxation side to products liability, all these different issues. So Kelly, why don't we get started? <coughs> Good morning, everybody. So uh, by a raise of hands, uh, who actually does 3D printing in the room today? Nobody? Good. Okay, so let's take it down to another level. Uh, well, let's start at the other end. Who in the room has no concept of what the hell we're talking about? So, okay, so we got a couple that have no idea what 3D printing is or additive manufacturing. And then there's probably a bunch of you that have read it in the Wall Street Journal, you've seen something on the internet but you really don't know what the hell's going on and why is the, uh, there a big buzz about it. So my goal today is to have a very uh, open and easy flowing conversation with you about 3D printing. I've got uh, a PowerPoint slide up here for convenience. I don't know if you heard that word yesterday at all. Um, you know, one email address uh, by Hillary uh, for convenience. So I have a presentation for convenience. So when I run out of things to talk about or you don't have any questions, I'll flip a slide and, and you know, try to talk about something next. So uh, I am a very practical person. Uh, I'm in business to do one thing and that is to make money. Uh, as a result of making money, I employ people and I can feed my kids and a whole bunch of other things, but ultimately I'm about making money. And so hopefully I can talk to you about why you can or can't make money in, in 3D printing. So very quickly, uh, I'll give you my uh, introduction. I'll talk to you at a very, very high level about the industry. Um, and then the cool thing about 3D printing and probably what everybody gets so excited about is the what's possible part of 3D printing. I mean, it literally opens your mind to new ways of designing and manufacturing and it really creates a lot of possibilities. Um, the the um, Discussion for this room, though, is probably more along the lines of what's probable. Because if you, you know, spend enough money, you can do anything, right? So we can spend enough money, we can build a rocket ship and go to the moon. But is that really probable? Well, not, not for us. Uh, maybe for somebody it is. So we'll talk about what's probable, and then I'll talk to you about what, uh, how you get started. And what I would do if I were sitting in your shoes, and I had a design, I had... Uh, you know, the, the flexibility of uh, maybe starting a business or not starting a business and what would I do in that, in that case. So uh, my intro, uh, I'm Kelly Goodsell. I actually own two companies here in the United States. One is a company called Viking Plastics. It is what more, uh, you would more put in the, in the category of a uh, true manufacturer, a mid-sized manufacturer. We've got 120 employees in Cory, Pennsylvania. We've got uh, 35, 40 machines. We've been in business for 40 years. And we do the traditional injection molding. You build a mold, you put it in a machine, you squirt plastic in it, and out come parts, and they go on cars and air conditioners and things of that nature. We have a facility in Suzhou, China, and also a small facility in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Uh, and so that business has been around for 40 years, and I, uh, I own that business. Three years ago, we started a company called Time Compression. And time compression is, as the name makes it sound, 
is focused on one thing. We want to compress the time that it takes for you to go from an idea on the back of your napkin to the time that you have a part in your hand, right? So the traditional manufacturing of injection molding at Viking is this. You get a concept, you put it on your napkin, you design it six weeks later, you get a prototype tool that takes eight weeks to machine and build, and then you put it in an injection molding machine, and then 24 later, weeks later, you build a production tool, and you make 500 parts, and you find out it didn't work, right? So that's almost a year-long process to get 500 parts to decide if it works or not. Time compression, literally, if you give me a design uh, uh, on a Friday, I can have a part for you on Monday. And I can have 20 parts for you on Friday, and the, you know, or Monday and the following Friday, probably all 500 parts. So our focus is on compressing the amount of time it takes to go from idea to, uh, to actual part. And it's based on 3D printing and, and the FDM process, which we'll get into. So what is uh, 3D printing? So there is this term uh, called AM, additive manufacturing. And uh, people throw it around, additive manufacturing, 3D printing is basically the same thing. And the idea is, Think about the old machine shop or tool shop that you probably know of or somebody knows of um, where you take a big hunk of steel, you put it on a machine, and you literally machine away material. So you're reducing the amount of material and what's left is the tool or the part that you want, right? So additive manufacturing is basically the exact opposite. On the left, it's 3D printing. And if you think about it, it's a fishing line literally the, the size of a fishing line or a weed whacker, little piece of plastic, that is fed into a 3D uh, uh, CNC controlled head and that unit will go back and forth on a table, this small up to you know as big as the table you're sitting at, and will drop plastic in the designed locations that you want it and it literally adds material or builds the part. And so that is 3D printing and you can do it in 3D shapes, sizes, um, and so that's on the left. So that is fused deposition modeling, which is a process uh, kind of standardized by a company called Stratasys, who's one of the largest producers of the machine, and um, is, is kind of the way that most people are going in terms of additive manufacturing these days. The second process over here on the left tends to be more around how you put materials together. So think of it as I'm going to put little droplets of material next to each other and then I'm going to um, basically uh, synthesize those pieces of plastic or steel and allow them to kind of melt themselves together. And so this is a bath of material and basically a, almost like a printing press. And so this will roll back and forth and the, the table literally pushes the part out of a pool of, of material. So wherever you want the material, it's controlled by the printer and it's controlled by the, the roller. And then there's a laser uh, that basically binds the material together. Make sense? So those are kind of the two major ways that you do additive manufacturing. So now let's talk about, and if you have questions, please ask. Right? Because otherwise I'm just going to get tired of talking and I'll stop. Um, <clears throat> so let's talk about what's possible. And this is really the sexy part of the industry. This is why people get so excited about it. This is why you see so much investment in it. This is why you see stock prices going way, way up. Um, because it is an exciting uh, technology and industry. It allows you to create new shapes, new designs, and new structures that you weren't able to do before. So if you understand injection molding, in order to make a component, sometimes you have things that are called undercuts or you have areas that you can't physically make because the metal will crash into each other when you put it in a mold. The nice thing about 3D printing is you just simply print the area that you want. And if you want to void, think of a balloon, if you want to void inside of that balloon, you just print the outside of the balloon and you don't put anything in the middle. And it allows you to do things that you've never been able to do before. So a couple of examples. So this product right here is not possible. You cannot machine that part unless you take you know weeks and weeks and weeks. 
You can injection mold that part, but you can 3D print that part in literally hours. The parts up on the right side, again, a very complex shape, something that allows you to design and develop a part that is otherwise not manufactured, or if you manufacture it, it is gonna cost you a ton of money and a whole lot of time. So one of the next uh, real sexy things about the industry and where you're seeing more and more and more 3D printing is around medical applications and the ability to uh, you know, give support. So the old days of putting a cast on a kid, right? You got a cast from here to here, it's itchy, it's hard, you know, you got to cut it off to get it x-rayed. Okay. Uh, I was worried there. It was going to get real boring real quick. Um, <clears throat> And by being able to 3D print, you can now do things that are the size of the person you're doing it for. So uh, uh, there's a dental application in here that comes up in a minute that you're actually printing teeth based on an x-ray. And uh, it really has made the industry jump. Um, you know, this is more fashion than it is functionality. But it gives you the idea of things that you can start printing robotic components, you can start printing medical components, and, and where those two meet really adds some, uh, some pretty interesting technology. So uh, I got the, the uh, lucky seat over here sitting next to William who uh, works for donuts, Clyde's Delicious Donuts. And you, know, you think, well, why, do you, why would somebody from food industry come to a 3D printing? One of the things that is really coming out in Hershey's Kisses and Hershey's Chocolate is one of the fastest developers of 3D printing in the world in the food industry because they are literally 3D printing chocolate shapes, names, faces that they can sell that otherwise you can't make. And so this is literally a 3D printed cake for a wedding. And you think about all the labor that people that make cakes go into to make this perfect cake and they give an extra little squeeze or they knock it over and their you know, whole day's worth of work is done. Literally they can 3D print a cake. So you start, you know, it kind of gets back to that comment of what's possible, right? It starts to open your mind to, hey, I wonder if we can 3D print, you know, X, Y, or Z and it starts making you think differently, which is pretty cool in, in, uh, in technology. The area that we get really excited about in manufacturing is it allows you to launch products faster, hence time compression. And so imagine the old days, you go into a dental, uh, into a dentist office and you need a tooth uh, replaced or you need a tooth, um, uh, you know, dental uh, work done and they would take a mold, they would send the mold out, you know, they would get the uh, teeth machine, they'd bring it back, you'd have to get it refitted, and all of that stuff takes time. In the meantime, the person that went into the dentist office doesn't have a tooth in their mouth, right? This is something that literally can be done in hours. You come in, you get your uh, x-ray done, they take a mold of your tooth, they take it over, they scan it, they put it in the 3D printer, and it prints dental uh, you know, support material or dental actual teeth and ceramic teeth and put them in your mouth a couple hours later. The idea is that it allows you to do something that you haven't been able to do before. And that's really where innovation and technology and excitement comes in the industry, right? The, the reason everybody gets so excited about Apple uh, watches is it's something that's never been done before. How do you do it and what do we get excited about? And so people go out and spend money on it. And it's the creative people that make this stuff possible. Um, <clears throat> here's a 3D printed shoe. So you think about how do we make a shoe, uh, you, you think about how do we make an Olympic athlete faster? Um, well, we don't need all the stuff that goes into supporting a, a foot other than we need something on the bottom that keeps their foot from getting hurt and we gotta be able to attach it to the foot somehow. And so by 3D printing, you've been able to eliminate a whole bunch of the material that's inside of a tennis shoe. And it, it allows people to run faster, it allows you to come up with different designs, et cetera. And then lastly, uh, where do you see it right now? What's possible? You see it in really high value, low volume products. So think about the airline industry. 
um, you think about uh, uh, defense, and you're able to eliminate a whole bunch of cost. You're able to um, just print the parts that you need, and you're able to do it for five parts, 50 parts, 100 parts, and you're able to do it in a whole lot less time. And so that's really where the technology uh, comes out. So that's all the sexy stuff, and you know, I just give you a few examples. The best thing for you to do is if you want to learn more about the technologies, get on the internet. It is amazing how much information is on the internet, and you can look at those things and see kind of the what's possible. The problem with what's possible is it's not really based in reality of what we're doing as a manufacturing industry right now, right you know today. GE can do this because they have a billion dollars that they're putting towards you know, 3D printing. Uh, the government can do it because they're putting a ton of money towards 3D printing. But a manufacturing company that's generating 10 or 20 million dollars revenue a year doesn't have that luxury. So what's pro what is uh, possible and, and what's probable? Um, we use it a lot for rapid prototyping. Uh, we use it to reduce waste and we reduce uh, cost with it as well. So this is a component uh, very similar to a product that we made. It is a steering component. So we had a magnesium part. Customer comes to us and says, hey, uh, you know, we'd like to look at maybe making this out of plastic. Well, first off, whoever designed it the first time was what, a metal guy, right? I mean, it was made out of magnesium. And so we took it and we started designing it and playing with it. And every time we designed it and made a new iteration, we were able to 3D print it for literally $100 and you know, eight hours of time, and we were able to take it back into the customer and say, here's what we need to do, here's how we need to tweak it. And they were able to actually fit it up on a steering column at uh, one of the automotive companies in less than a week and say, does it fit or doesn't it? And what can we do to improve it? So being able to really turn those prototypes and those concepts from a napkin to a part really, really helps the process. The second is you have less waste. So literally they printed 100 parts here, uh, a, uh, a gear profile, and all you print are the parts that you need. So you don't actually, um, you know, in the injection molding process, you would need to have a runner, you would have all the steel that goes with it. Literally you are taking the plastic in one form and you're putting it together on the table uh, in another form. And so it reduces a lot of waste and, uh, and obviously a lot of cost. Here's one of the things that are going on and why we have to watch this technology in, in terms of how other people use it. So our competitors in the world, China for example, can take our products, put it on a table, use a scanner uh, over there on the left hand side, scan the part into a 3D image, take that 3D image, turn it around and print it on a 3D printer, and in less than 48 hours take what has taken GM or Ford or Chrysler or Viking Plastics years to design and develop, and literally in less than 48 hours they can have a mock-up of that product on their shelf in their office. So all of a sudden you start going, wow, that changes the game, it changes the scope of manufacturing because everything is digital. Once you have a, a, uh, an image, you can print it. Once you have a print, you can convert it into a CAD file that goes to a tool maker if you're wanting to make hundreds and thousands of them, but if you're only making five or ten, it's a, a, a very fast process. And you know, some people have seen it in the auto shows. Uh, they've actually started printing actual cars. So they've taken all the components that they put together, they print all the individual pieces, put it together, and literally they drove a 3D printed car off the show at, uh, in Detroit earlier this year. Now it doesn't drive down the highway yet, but you, you know, it, it's getting there. So <clears throat> how would I get started if I were you? So you got this great idea, maybe you've got a manufacturing company that you're producing product today, and you know, one of your engineers come to you and say, hey, we need to buy this 3D printer. This is a cool technology, and I got all kinds of ideas, and this thing will run all the time. Here's my suggestion for you. Number one is find a service provider. And when I say a service provider, that's somebody like Time Compression. 
I know there are people here in Chicago that do it for you uh, in terms of 3D printers uh, and 3D uh, printing companies, but I would find a service provider. And the reason I say that is there are lots and lots of people that are investing in machinery, but the machinery is changing so fast, the technology, the cost structure of, te uh, of the machinery is changing fast, and the individual materials that you may need for your individual application are probably difficult to predict. And so for you to go out and buy a $3,000 machine that probably can print this, well, that's fantastic, right? But this isn't something that's gonna go into a car or you're gonna be able to take into your customer. So there are different technology levels and the way I would do it if I were you is I would go out and I would find a 3D printing company or a rapid prototyping company and I would say, give me a quote on this CAD model. So here's a 3D file, a CAD model of a part, back of the napkin design, and we would like to have a quote. And basically they're gonna come back and they're gonna tell you it's somewhere between $100 and $1,500. And that will then allow you to start experimenting with how fast can we get it, how do we use it. Um, uh, a short uh, note on how we use it at Viking Plastics. We use it in two ways. Number one way is we use it on our manufacturing floor to do things that used to take us weeks and weeks and machine time and labor to do in terms of machining, nests and fixtures and robotics and end of arm tools. And now we just print them. And literally, we get a CAD file, and we'll print an end of arm tool, and 48 hours later, we've got something that's going back to the manufacturing plant, and it's saving time, and it's saving money, and oh, by the way, it's lighter. And if it breaks, you print another one. Or if it's not right, you tweak the design, and you print another one. As opposed to if you machine it the wrong way, you throw that whole hunk of steel away, all the labor that was generating that, that uh, part, and, um, and uh, you know, you're, it's waste. The second way we use it is we use it to sell our customers. I would say 60% of the jobs that we take uh, a quote into our customer and we bring a 3D printed part with us, we win that work. So you as my competitor walk in and talk to Sally Sue, the, the purchasing uh, agent, and you, you know, there's three of us in a room that are trying to compete for this job and she says, what's your price? And you say it's 15 cents. And she says, well, your tooling's a little high. And you, you kind of, OK, well, thanks for the feedback. The next person comes in, 15 cents. Your tooling's pretty competitive, but you know, we're, you're a little far away. We walk in for 15 cents, same tooling numbers, and we have a part in our hand. And we look at her and we say, well, you told us our tooling's a little high. Well, did your competitors know that there's this undercut area over here and they're gonna have to you know, really be careful in the tool steel to make that part? All of a sudden, we build so much credibility with our purchasing people and with our customers that when it comes down to the room and you're trying to decide whether you're gonna source me or the other two people, you look at it and you go, well, that one company, that Viking Plastics guy, he, he's got a part. I mean, he showed me the part. They know what they're making. And it has been a huge uh, success story for us. So if you're looking for how do you do that, I would go test the waters with a service provider, with somebody that is doing rapid prototyping today. The second is I would work with the machine suppliers. If you go to Stratasys, if you go to some of the manufacturers of the actual machines and say, hey, I'm looking, I'm really serious. I've done some service provider work. I've gotten some quotes. I've gotten some parts and I really want to, I'm interested in buying a machine, I would go to the, to the machine suppliers and ask them to come into your facility and provide you parts, different materials, and different technologies, and they will do that for free. So that you don't have to actually buy the machine to run the parts, they will run them for you. And I would keep leaning on them until they squeal, because there is no way you want to spend $50,000 or $100,000 on a machine that isn't going to fit your needs especially if it's only gonna run three, four, six hours a week as opposed to 24 seven. And then the third area that I would encourage you if, you, you know, if you're just looking around, if you don't really need to buy a machine yet, but you wanna understand the industry and the technology better, spend time on the internet. It is amazing what you can find in terms of 
actually watching things print. Uh, a lot of manufacturing companies like ourselves actually have uh, live web streaming of you know things being printed, um, and you will it will open your eyes to the technology that you really uh, uh, will be amazed at, um, and it's all free, obviously you know being on the internet. So that is, I think, yep, that's what I would do if I were you. Given you know nobody in the room's got a machine. <clears throat> so you're kind of walking before you run. You're trying to learn more about the industry. I would take uh, your salespeople. I would take your engineers. I would have them learn about the industry. Um, and then I would kind of test the waters with machine suppliers and with uh, uh, service providers to, to give you quotes and to give you some samples. Because you'll be amazed. The first time your salesperson goes in and you see the look on the purchasing person or the engineer, uh, engineering manager's face and, and they look at you and go, wow, a part in my hand, it, it changes the selling process dynamics in a big, big way. So with that, any questions? Yep. Um, how does it affect intellectual property? It would seem to me that the I'm going to tell you that we have a whole bunch of lawyers to get paid for that. <laughs> My, in, my, I will tell you that my intellectual property, you know, that's as far as I go. I can spell it, I think, and, you know. Yeah, we'll be talking about that in a little bit. Okay. Any questions for Kelly or anything? So is there a limit on the material that you can put on the Yeah, so the technology, I mentioned the technology is changing literally on a daily basis, right? The size of the machine, the cost of the machine. And the biggest area of change is materials. So right now, the biggest material, the most common used material is ABS. But they also print in high temperature materials like Ultem, which is a PEI material. Um, the kind of engineering grades of acetal and nylon and polypropylene and glass reinforced materials are not common yet. And so those are things that are in development. Uh, there are a number of rubbery, uh, you know, kind of thermoplastic elastomer-like materials um, that are being used. And so um, material is a big, a big area that, that's being developed. And there's only like about 160 materials you can use right now. And so the big play, we were talking about this before, is do you want to get into the equipment or rather would you go into the material? Because if you expand upon that, that's probably where the biggest profit's going to be. Yeah. And that goes back to, do you buy a machine that has the capability of making five or six materials when if you're a big manufacturing company, you may need a soft material, you may need a hard material, you may need high temperature, low temperature, and you know, do you get all that off of one machine or do you just go get it from a service provider? Yeah, we're doing metals too. I mean, that's the big thing NASA's doing. I mean, you heard probably about the 3D printer they put up there so they don't have to send uh, and replacement parts up there anymore for that? There are a couple of trade shows that I would mention. One is NPE, which is the uh, plastics exposition show that's going on later this month down in Orlando. has got a whole section devoted to 3D printing this year. And then uh, there's a show uh, called RAPID, R-A-P-I-D, uh, that is in late May. Last year was in Detroit. I'm not sure where it is this year. California is here. Is it California? Um, and that show is, uh, is all dedicated to rapid manufacturing, 3D printing, additive manufacturing, and uh, it, you know, it's, it's worth a, a walk if you're in the area. Yes, ma'am? How do the food grade machines differ from the ones that would print as an issue? Well, so it, it all comes down to the uh, melting of the material going in, because you have to get it in a liquid form, and then the cooling process coming out. So for uh, machines that are running ABS or Ultem, the temperature of the control head is much hotter, you know, 500, 600, 700 degrees, where if you're melting chocolate, it's not as hot. Uh, but, you, you know, the window of control is much more delicate. The chocolate-covered shoe is pretty good. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Right, we'll go to the next one. Thank you very much.